Good afternoon and welcome to today's OR Today webinar, Dispelling Myths About the Joint Commission. Today we are joined by Sil Sylvia Garcia Halchins, Director of Infection Prevention and Control <clears throat> excuse me, in the Division of Healthcare Improvement at the Joint Commission. OR Today's webinar would like to thank today's sponsor, the Joint Commission. The Joint Commission, an independent not-for-profit organisation, is the nation's oldest and largest standards-setting and accrediting body in healthcare, offering a robust portfolio of accreditation and certification programmes across the continuum of care. The Joint Commission's Ambulatory Care Accreditation Programme helps ambulatory sur surgery centres meet rigorous performance standards for improved patient safety and enhanced quality outcomes. Accreditation helps ASCIs pro proactively minimise risk areas for patients and staff and creates a performance-focused competitive edge. For more information, visit ahcquality at jointcommission.org. Today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour. You can obtain your certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE certificate. You'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Let's kick off today's webinar by giving away one of our brand new OR Today Live lunch bags to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. March is National Peanut Month. Which state is the largest producer of peanuts? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard and I'll reveal the answer at the end of the webinar. As I mentioned earlier, our presenter today is Sylvia garcia Houchins. Sylvia, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. I'm going to appreciate everybody joining me today. I am Sylvia Garcia Houchins. I'm the Director of Infection Prevention and Control here at the Joint Commission, but I'm also an ambulatory surveyor, so I do go out to ambulatory surgery centers for survey. I want to start out by saying I have nothing to disclose, um, no, no, uh, no, no conflicts, and I also want to go over our disclaimer. So these slides are current as of March 1st, 2023, and these slides can only be used as cue points. So I will be expounding on these slides. Um, and, and it's very important that if you are listening to this webinar to help yourself get to the point of accreditation that you look at your program specific manual for specific requirements related to your accreditation process. I also wanna say that there are some pictures of products that are provided as examples and they do not constitute an endorsement or a criticism of any product or manufacturer. These slides cannot be further used, shared, or distributed without my permission. Um, they are copyrighted to the Joint Commission. If you do, um, at some point, want to use one of these slides, please contact me. Um, my information is at the end of the slide, and we can discuss um, where and how you would plan to use those. Today, what we're going to talk about is the Joint Commission's role at, in the regulatory process. I'll just, we're going to talk about the approach that accrediting accredited organizations can use to ensure compliance with infection control requirements and whether or not where your accreditor or somebody else is it's important to know that this um, approach will make sure that you are following the required infection control um, processes. I'm also going to explain the role of evidence-based guidelines in the survey process. So first I want to start with who is the Joint Commission? So you heard the introduction. Um, we are the largest accreditor of healthcare organizations in the US, but a lot of people don't understand who we are and what our role is. As the largest accreditor of healthcare organizations, um, that is the Joint Commission. That's the accreditation arm. We also have a consulting arm, which does education, publications, and consulting, which is known as Joint Commission Resources but there is a firewall between the two and we would never share accreditation information between the two entities. We are your partner to help you understand what the requirements are to support your goals and really to provide resource for you. In As acting in resource, we do provide solutions for your organization that you may not even be aware of and are available on our website really to anybody who wants to go and look. For example, we have a quick safety that was developed by infection preventionists 
um, that addresses is that instrument ready to be reprocessed? Is it appropriate to be reprocessed based on things that we have seen in the field? Um, organizations who are reprocessing items that are broken or, uh, or non-functional in some way, reprocessing um, items for medical use that are not actually medical devices. Um, for example, kitchen spoons um, to be used in, in DNCs. We have seen it and we want to make sure that organizations know that this is an unsafe practice. Um, we want to make sure that your instruments are in the best condition possible. And so we developed a quick safety to provide a resource. Another one that we found to be very helpful to organizations is one that talks about how products are labeled. Um, do, does your staff know what a two with a line through it mean? Do they know that that means it should not be reused or reprocessed? So we provide resources um, to the healthcare field to make sure that best practices and safety is always at the forefront. We are an advocate to states and payers and CMS, but we are not a regulatory body. We do not write law. Uh, we do not write regulation. We um, are an accrediting organization. So as an accrediting organization, there are three parts to the Joint Commission. There are the Division of Standards and Survey Methods. That's the part of the Joint Commission that writes the standards. When we write standards, we put them out for field, they're based on evidence, and then we put them out for field review. And people like people in the audience have the right to review those standards and write back and say, this doesn't make sense, or you need to add this, or you haven't addressed that. Um, so you all are part of that process. There is the accreditation and certification operations. That's the survey part of the Joint Commission. Those are the surveyors who will go out to organizations and accredit organizations. And then there's the standards interpretation group. That is the group that interprets the standards. So once the survey is done, the report that's generated moves from the survey part of the Joint Commission to the standards interpretation group to make sure that all of the standards have been applied um, fairly and equitably and consistently amongst organizations. There is also the Office of Quality and Patient Safety. And many people don't know about that part of the Joint Commission. That is the part of the Joint Commission um, that if someone has a complaint about the quality or the safety of the care that they received or that they are providing at their organization, um, they can file a complaint with the Joint Commission and the Joint Commission will follow up on it. Um, this is where things like sentinel events get reported. Um, and Sometimes it results in a surveyor being sent to the organization. Sometimes it causes um, someone at the Joint Commission to contact that organization for more information, but they are all followed up on. And if a report is made anonymously, we would um, do our best, and we do. Um, if you wanna make a report and you decide, I don't want my name used, we would keep that anonymous. So they do do um, the handling of complaints. I then want to move to the survey process. There's a lot of myths, um, a lot of misunderstandings about the survey process. And I would like to say that the best place to get information about the Joint Commission survey process is to contact the Joint Commission. If there's ever a question about standards interpretation, what does this standard mean? What does this element of performance mean? What do I need to do to meet this? The best group to go to is the standards interpretation group. That's what they do all the time for the surveyors, for our customers. And there is a way on the Joint Commission website to ask those questions and have them answered. And I always want to reassure people that if you ask a question, it is not tied back to your survey or your surveyor. They don't get to know what questions you've asked, so you don't have to worry about that. So as far as the survey process, our goal when we do come to on site to your organization is to really validate compliance with our standards and if deemed compliance with the conditions for participation or coverage. We wanna provide a meaningful assessment of risk. What does that mean? That means when you have a set of fresh eyes in your organization who are seeing things from a different standpoint and can say, there is risk here. There is risk to a patient, there is risk to a staff, there is financial risk, there is um, risk to, you, to your um, standing in the community if something goes wrong. 
and we want to try our best to identify those. We also want to inspire and encourage improvement through dialogue with your staff, your physicians, and your leaders. And finally, we want to assist you in your journey of providing consistently safe, high-quality care. And so as um, a surveyor, I can tell you when I meet with an organization at the beginning, I let them know that this is my goal. And I also ask, what are their expectations? What do they want out of the survey process? And sometimes you hear things and you think, wow, all they want to do is pass the survey. And I really encourage you all to think about why your organization is accredited. And it's really, you're accredited to meet a minimum level of quality and safety, but it's also to help you identify risks and where you might have opportunities for improvement. Important thing about the survey process is we don't use checklists. So many times organizations will say, well, can you just give me a checklist so that I can go and make sure I'm ready? We don't use checklists. The reason we don't use checklists is checklists are really great for compliance. They are really good if you already know what the issue is and you wanna make sure that you are complying with whatever the issue is. And I like to use this example, the sterilization packaging audit tool. Um, why do I like this one? Because I can look at a peel pouch and say, does it meet all these things? Is there anything wrong with it? The problem is it doesn't actually tell me anything about what other risks there may be. That, that is what we use the tracer methodology for. The tracer methodology is what the surveyor uses to identify risks. And it's a really robust process in that it never ends up at the same point. Every time you start and select a patient, you are going to get to a different path and to a different set of issues depending on what's happening with that individual patient. So unlike a checklist where you're always looking for the same things, by using this technique, you can identify all kinds of risks that you would not have normally done. So what you are seeing here is an example of a tracer. We start with a sample patient. We'll usually come in and say, what type of, what type of patient do you see here? What type of procedures do you do? What care treatment and services do you provide? And then what, what do you do a lot of? What do you do a little of? What can I look at and what's the most likely place that there are going to be risks? We pick a patient and then we trace. We will normally do at least one patient from start through finish, from the moment they hit the waiting room until they leave your organization. We are going to follow their care through that pathway. Now, what's interesting is in the waiting room, we may see an issue with security or we may see an issue with patient privacy, or maybe the waiting room is dirty. And so there's an issue with the sanitary environment. We're then gonna follow the patient into an exam room, a procedure room, pre-op waiting, and we're gonna follow their care there. And it may be that we review, during the review of the process, we may see uh, the nurse is supposed to hang, uh, has an order to write uh, to hang either an IV with lactated ringers or 0.9 normal saline but the order doesn't tell the nurse which to hang. It just says, start an IV with lactated ringers or normal saline. Well, that's an incomplete order. That puts the nurse at risk of having to choose the appropriate IV solution to hang. Um, and that also means that that nurse needs to know exactly what's gonna to happen to that patient, what kind of anesthetic they're going to use, what risk factors the patient may have, are they a diabetic? And so it's very important that at that point, we're already starting to look at risks. What is the risk to the patient and what is the risk to the nurse when she starts a medication that she does not have a complete order for? We would then follow that patient through. And from an infection control standpoint in the procedure room, we're going to be looking at personal protective equipment. We're going to look at reprocessing. We may look at ventilation. But depending on which way we go is what, where we're going to identify risk. The important thing here is everybody's survey is different. So often what we hear back is, well, they came to my place and they found this. And I know you're doing that too, but they didn't find it at yours because maybe the patient situation was different. The other thing we do is when we survey, we use a hierarchical approach to verifying that an organization has met infection control requirements. What does that mean? So in April of 2019, um, I had just been at the Joint Commission probably six months, um, we thought it would be a good idea for organizations to know 
how do we approach what the requirements are from an infection control standpoint? So we created this visual. It's the hierarchical approach to deciding, are you following the infection control requirements? The way it starts is, are you following the appropriate rules and regulations? Examples of those include OSHA, FDA, EPA, your local licensing requirements. If you are a deemed organization, are you following the state operations manual? Are you following the relevant program? For example, if you are if you're providing surgical services in a hospital, it would be covered under the conditions of participation for hospitals. If you're an ambulatory surgery center, then it would be scored under the conditions of conditions for coverage as an ambulatory surgery center. So the requirements are going to be different based on which state operations manual you are required to follow. The next level of the hierarchy is manufacturer's instructions. And we know and we have heard from all of our customers that this is becoming a real challenge. Organizations must be following manufacturer instructions when they reprocess medical devices. Now you are at the stage of the hierarchy where you've got three levels, rules and regulations, CMS requirements if you're deemed, and manufacturer's instructions. Those are the basic requirements that would impact your infection control findings during survey. The next two levels are evidence-based guidelines and national standards and consensus documents. Those are your choice unless they're required by a state regulation. For example, if you are an ambulatory center in Illinois, then you must follow certain CDC guidelines as part of your ambulatory surgery center. If, in contrast, you're an ambulatory surgery center in New Jersey, you may have to follow Amy ST79 when it comes to your disinfection and sterilization procedures. So part of what we are looking at is which evidence-based guidelines or consensus documents are you required to follow? The Joint Commission only requ requires a few, and I'm going to go into that in a couple minutes. But if you follow this hierarchy, you should get to the right place. You should have the right infection control processes, policies, and protocols in place. Now, the next part of this that's really important for organizations to understand in this approach is that if your organization chooses to write a policy that is more restrictive than what the hierarchy would say is required, so those first three parts, if you choose to follow an evidence-based guideline or consensus document that is more restrictive and you put it into your policy, then your joint commission surveyor must survey according to your policy. So we will hold you to that more restrictive standard. About 65% of the survey findings that the joint commission finds are related to an organization's policies. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that at the end. I want to go into a little bit of detail about regulations that may apply in the operating room. So I've given you some of the common sources of infection control related regulations. I also want to add to that local, state, and federal building code. Why is that? Because operating rooms are built to code requirements that are normally promulgated by your state. So what may be required in one state may not be required in others. And when your operating rooms were built is going to make a difference. So if your operating rooms, for example, were, were built in 1996, when the code requirement was that you could have a clean or sterile core that flew into your operating rooms, then you would be meeting that code even today, as long as you have not renovated your operating rooms. But if you built new operating rooms in 2018, when the code is that the operating rooms must be positive to everything, then that's what the surveyor is going to score you for. So very important that organizations be aware of what their requirements are. OSHA has requirements for personal protective equipment, but they are not prescriptive. What they do is they require that the organization perform a hazard assessment, they develop an exposure control plan, and they update it annually. That the organization identify, provide, and maintain appropriate PPE, and that they train the employees in the use and care of that PPE, and then finally, they actually use the words up to and including termination that they enforce its use. So what does that mean? 
Well, first of all, operating rooms need to differentiate between personal protective equipment and dress code requirements. Are your scrubs a dress code requirement? Probably. They are probably not personal protective equipment, however. That would be your fluid resistant or fluid proof gowns that you would use during surgery. So being very clear on where the requirement is and when it is a requirement. So if you follow the hierarchy, the Joint Commission would expect you to follow OSHA requirements because they are regulations related to personal protective equipment. But your dress code is not required by regulation. So that is the part where there is choices to be made. What are the key elements that a surveyor will look for? These are some of the places that the surveyor could score if there was an issue with personal protective equipment. Now, everybody says, well, how am I supposed to know this? How am I supposed to know that this is what the surveyor is looking for? The Joint Commission actually puts out examples of what they will score, and every accredited organization has access to that. Every month, the Joint Commission publishes its official newsletter, which is called Perspectives. Perspectives includes examples of how we're going to score our standards. For example, with personal protective equipment, it might give an example that the organization did not provide the appropriate size personal protective equipment. And it would tell you that that was going to be scored under the standard that's listed here, ICO 10201 EP3. So not only are we there to survey, we are also there as a resource to make sure that you are ready for a survey. This is an example of an excerpt from Perspectives. So this is one that, that often gets scored. The organization did not provide sufficient training or assess competency to ensure that staff knew which PPE to don or how to don and doff the PPE safely. And then we give examples. We give examples of findings. So these are actual examples that surveyors have scored. For example, staff was observed wearing surgical mask around the neck outside of the department where exposure could occur against the organization's policy. So that's really important. When you read perspectives and you look at the examples, what are we scoring it against? If it says it was not in accordance with the organization's policy, it means we're, there is no joint commission requirement. There may not even be an OSHA or regulatory requirement. In this case, it was because the organization's policy stated that that cannot be done. It's so really important when you hear about somebody being scored for something that you understand the foundation under which it was scored. Here's how building code could impact. In hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers, they tend to have very prescriptive building codes. And if the state does not have an applicable building code, and the example I will give you there is Ohio. Ohio tends to have very few code requirements. Um, they may not have a specific building code for an ambulatory surgery center. And in that case, we would default to Facilities Guideline Institute standards for the year that the facility was built. As compared to office-based surgery and clinics, which are less regulated by states and usually have no little or no applicable regulation, then something there might not be scorable. We do try to provide direction by updating and providing frequently asked questions. So here's an example of something that often comes up during survey um, and is probably one of our most frequently asked questions. Do we need to monitor the temperature and humidity in rooms where sterile supplies are stored? Well, what you will see is that the first thing we say is, well, first follow the hierarchy. Is there a regulation that requires that you have a specific temperature and humidity in the areas where sterile supplies are stored? So if there is, then our expectation would be that you would follow that requirement. So if you have a building code requirement. However, that building code requirement isn't always the final answer. So if you look at most states' building code requirements, they use this table, ASHRAE uh, Table 7.1, which talks about design parameters. And this is an example for one that's used in hospital spaces. And what you will notice highlighted in red is sterile processing departments, sterile storage room, and then you move to the right. The maximum 
humidity is 60%. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble seeing my slide, but the, there's a maximum temperature and humidity, right? So the maximum humidity is 60%, and the design temperature has a maximum of 75 degrees. So the expectation in that sterile supply room would be that you would be able to monitor that those parameters are being met. So in that case, you do have to monitor temperature and humidity. But look at the support stays. That's the part in mustard. That support stay, if you are putting your sterile supplies into your support space, into a clean workroom or clean holding, then that room needs to be at positive pressure, but there is no design humidity requirement and there is no design temperature requirement. So in those cases, we would not require that your organization monitor the temperature and humidity. So very important, again, to know where the requirement is and why it is a requirement. This is for ambulatory surgery centers. So facility types that are included in ambulatory surgery and outpatient FGI guidelines usually fall into three categories. And one of them is that what's required by your state or local building category. So important to know your code requirements. The next level of the hierarchy when we use examples are CMS requirements. And I have people ask me this all the time. Where do I find the CMS requirements? Well, this is one where the answer is there. It has been there forever, but people don't know where to look for it. And so on the left, you will see the Medicare State Operations Manual. This is the appendix that is used. And just to let you know, these slides have been posted as a handout, so they are available to you. And if you look at the bottom of this page, you can see that that appendix, the one on the left, is available on the CMS website. As an organization, you find what type of organization you are. Are you a hospital? Are you an ambulatory surgery center? What kind of care are you providing? You click on the letter that's in color, so in this case, the blue letter, and you will get the state operations manual for that program. So in this case, on the second page, I clicked L for appendix for ambulatory surgery centers, and I got the state operations manual for ambulatory surgical centers who would like to be deemed or approved through CMS. Important to note that infection control is integrated throughout these documents. So it's important to not only look at one specific chapter of this um, state operations manual. For example, you will find information about infection control also under surgical services and vice versa. So you always wanna be doing that. You always wanna be looking in different parts um, to make sure you've actually gotten the right answer. And the other important part is that this state of operations manual gets updated regularly. So you will see in red, it says revision 206-617-2022. This was just updated less than a year ago. So if you want to know the most recent requirements, you need to keep up with the updates. This is an example of what you will find in the state operations manual under hospitals, infection control. The first part is the condition or the standard that is being met. That is what's called the regulation part of it. This is what CMS says the organization must do in order to be deemed. So in this case, the Infection Prevention and Control Program includes surveillance, prevention and control of HAIs, including a clean and sanitary environment, and addressing all infection control issues identified by public health authority. So just like the Joint Commission standard, people say, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? What do I have to do? And so for that reason, CMS provides interpretive guidance. So the hospital must provide and maintain a clean sanitary environment. That makes a lot of sense. And the infection pro control program should include appropriate monitoring of air handlers, autoclaves, surgical areas, supply storage. So it tells the surveyor and the organization what is the surveyor going to look at? What are they supposed to be doing? And then finally, the state operation manual actually gives survey procedures. What is the surveyor to do to identify issues of compliance or non-compliance. The next level in the hierarchy is manufacturer's instructions for use. And I know that this has created a challenge across the country. 
manufacturer's instructions for use are required for medical devices that are being reprocessed. It is part of their labeling. So where do you find that requirement? The FDA put out guidance in 2015 and actually adopted it in 2017, and it's called Reprocessing of Medical Devices in Healthcare Setting, and it was guidance to the industry and FDA staff. But from a usability standpoint, who can use it? Anybody can use it. It's available on the, on the FDA website. And the important part here is what does the FDA expect manufacturers of these medical devices to do as far as reprocessing? They are very clear that manufacturers must follow the Spalding classification meaning is it critical, semi-critical, or in a non-critical device, and is it being reprocessed accordingly? So this is an example of the Spalding classification, and the Spalding classification tells users the minimum level of reprocessing that must be required when an instrument is used. So, for example, it's a blood pressure cuff. It comes only in contact with, with intact skin, it has to be cleaned or low-level disinfected between uses in accordance with its manufacturer's instructions. However, if it's going to be used on a mucous membrane, and here's the big one I always think of is endocavity probes, speculums, um, things that you may have done in an office, the minimum level of reprocessing is high-level disinfection. Can you choose to sterilize your speculums? Absolutely. But our requirement and the FDA's requirement is that the minimum level of reprocessing is high level disinfection. And then there's finally, there's critical use. Those are the instruments that get used on sterile tissues. Um, they enter the vascular system, things like surgical instruments and bicep, biopsy forceps. In those cases, those items need to be sterilized. Again, this information is available to any organization you just need to know where to look to find the requirements. The instructions for use for the medical device drives compliance. So often I get asked, hey Sylvia, aren't I supposed to follow the sterilizer parameters? Well, yes, you're supposed to follow the sterilizer parameters for the medical device. But what about the buttons on my sterilizer? Doesn't that tell me that it's a peel pouch and I can just press the peel pouch cycle? And the answer there is no you have to look at that individual medical device to determine what the appropriate sterilization parameters. From an FDA standpoint, the medical device is at the center and everything else you use to reprocess it is an accessory. So everything else is important to get to the right place, but that medical device is the key driver. And that's why I've given you this important example. So think about that debakey that you've used on your field. You might use a Debakey from any number of manufacturers. The manufacturer's instructions for each of those Debakeys takes into account what is it made out of? What kind of stainless steel did they use? What are the key elements in keeping that in chief operating performance? Well, if you look at the different manufacturer's instructions, you will notice, and this is something simple like just keeping it moist, Manufacturer A says, if you can't reprocess immediately, use an enzymatic foam sprayer. Manufacturer B says, keep it moist for transit, but they don't tell you how. Manufacturer C says, immediately after the procedure, cover with a towel moistened with sterile distilled water. Foam spray gel products are available, so you could use those instead. And Manufacturer D gives you no instructions on how to keep it moist. What is a Joint Commission surveyor supposed to do? they are going to look at your instructions for use, they're going to pick an instrument and they're going to trace the instrument. Are you following the manufacturer's instructions for that instrument? If you are, you're not gonna have any issues on survey. The IFUs will also direct how an item is stored. And we often get this question, do I have to store it in a special place? Well, what I have done here is I have pulled the instructions for three different products. The one on the left is basically medical devices that are being sterilized by the organization. And in this case, this manufacturer basically says, after you sterilize it, put it in a dry and dust-free place. And the shelf life depends on how you protect it, how you store it, and how you handle it. 
but the maximum shelf life is de de developed by the organization. So what are they saying? That you can use event-related sterility. The one on the right at the top talks about general storage pre and post sterilization. So what does that mean? When we talk about general storage pre and post sterilization, they are talking about the sterilization wraps, which they are saying store them in a clean, dust-free environment and away from fluorescent or ultraviolet light and use a first in, first out uh, stock rotation. And by the way, please refer to Amy or ANSI for storage conditions. The last one is about endoscopes, and they talk about protecting the equipment from physical damage and not coiling it beyond a certain coil because you will cause damage. All of these things are part of the manufacturing instructions that will lead to safe care for your patient. Now, you just saw in the example that the instructions for use may incorporate certain evidence-based guidelines or consensus documents. For example, the manufacturer on the left says, follow the device manufacturer's sterilization parameters. And they also say, follow recommended practices and guidelines outlined by AORN and AMI. But they don't tell you which specific ones. So in that case, you're going to follow the manufacturer's specific instructions for use. And if you need more information about recommended practice or best practice guidelines, you can go to AORN and AMI. The one on the right is much more specific. It says for immediate use steam sterilization, you need a three, three pulse pre-vacuum system. You need to be sterilizing at 270 degrees for four minutes. And by the way, they, rec they say immediate use steam sterilization is not recommended as a routine practice. And please refer to Amy ST79 for requirements on when to perform and how to control immediate use steam sterilization. So much more prescriptive. What would the surveyor be doing? They'd be verifying that you followed the 270 for four minutes in the right kind of sterilizer and that you are looking at those requirements and implementing the requirements outlined by Amy ST79. So we've now gone through the first three steps of the hierarchy and what's required. The last part is evidence-based guidelines and consensus documents. And this is so important. What's in a name is what I call this. What is the difference between an evidence-based guideline and a consensus document? And by the way, isn't a guideline the same as guidance? And they are not the same. When you read a document, you need to be able to differentiate between a guideline, guidance, a consensus document, or any opposition statement, or any other type of recommendations that are made. So I love that CDC put this out. They put this out in, at the end of 2022, but this is the way that CDC develops their evidence-based guidelines. Is the CDC does not say that it is an evidence-based guideline. So they will actually say guideline for isolation guideline for care of fiber optic endoscopes, guideline for whatever it is, then it is a guideline and it has been through a review process. They have done a literature search, they have abstracted and summarized the evidence, they have assessed the quality of the evidence, and then they have drafted recommendations and used a consensus group to say, what of this makes sense for healthcare organizations to do and what level of evidence is there? Other organizations other than the CDC that do provide evidence-based guidelines include AORN, American College of Surgeons, Anesthesiology Groups, SHEA, which is the Epidemiology Group, APIC, and the World Health Organization. What is common to all of these? They follow a process that includes finding evidence through the literature, summarizing that evidence, determining is it compelling evidence, and then writing a guideline. Does an organization have to follow this guideline? Only if it is required by the Joint Commission standards, by a rule or regulation, by CMS, or by a manufacturing instructions. Otherwise, it is your choice. The important thing to remember here is the use of the word guideline. If it does not say it is a guideline, then it does not fall into the guideline category. It may fall into the consensus category. So anything that is goes 
through the consensus process and is called an American National Standard, it means that it has gone through a voluntary consensus standard development following ANSI's essential requirements. ANSI says they have to follow a specific procedure. That procedure includes having um, an open process that allows anybody who has material contributions to participate. So that could be users of the guidelines, or the, sorry, like users of the consensus documents, like nurses um, and physicians and laboratory techs or surgical techs. It could be manufacturers. It could be regulators. It could be members of the Joint Commission, anybody who believes they have a contribution to make to that consensus document. And by the way, ISO standards are also based on consensus. They are, may or may not have been a literature review process as part of their development. So an example of a consensus document are AMI standards. They are developed by technical mini committees or working groups that operate as consensus bodies. They do follow a process similar to what the Joint Commission does, right, of sending it out for review and comment. However, they do not do that literature review part when they are developing these consensus documents. It is not part of their process, although they may include some literature. These consensus documents may be incorporated by reference into regulation, and I've given you two good examples here. Um, these are New Jersey, which I mentioned earlier, that require use of specific um, incorporated by reference into their law, or Illinois, that requires certain guidelines to be used when developing your policies and procedures and practices. CMS has recently given us some great guidance that I want you all to be aware of. In 2022, they published interpretive guidance related to the use of evidence-based guidelines in both the hospital program and the ambulatory surgery program. And basically what they say is that organizations should use evidence-based approaches to develop their infection prevention and control processes. However, organizations are at liberty to select and follow those evidence-based guidelines or consensus documents that meet their requirements. So it has been made very clear that you should have a deliberative process to identify which evidence-based guidelines, consensus documents, et cetera, you want to use, and then which you have chosen to put into your own policies and procedures. Which evidence-based guidelines does the Joint Commission require? We actually require very few. We require compliance with CDC and or WHO hand hygiene guidelines, which is a national patient safety goal. We require compliance with those with standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. We require that organizations follow any evidence-based guideline that's required by applicable regulation. We require compliance with those requirements of your chosen evidence-based guidelines. So that's where it's very important to look at the wording. And we remind you that your chosen evidence-based guidelines cannot be less restrictive than regulation, CMS requirements, the instructions for use, or joint commission requirements, and that your choice could impact your survey. So here's an example. Joint commission requires compliance with 1A, 1B, and 1C requirements of the CDC or and or WHO hand hygiene guideline. If an organization chooses something like AORN, periodic guidelines for perioperative practices, it's very important to look at them in context with how the document was written. And I will tell you, having been on the guidelines page, the AORN guidelines page, you have to look at the introduction and then you actually have to click the button to say more information to find what is highlighted here. A should indicates that a certain course of action is recommended. A must is used only to describe requirements mandated by government regulation. A may is permissible within certain limits. So it's very important as you are going through these evidence-based guidelines to know what the authors meant by word choice. The bottom line is your choice will affect your survey outcome, no matter whether it's the Joint Commission, a CMS surveyor, or a state surveyor. And I'd like to give you an example of that. 
during the survey, uh, a surveyor does an OR tracer and they write a finding. The organization failed to implement its dress code. Uh, so that's a policy. Their dress code is a policy. As evidenced by the circulating nurse had fingernails that were enhanced with nail lac lac lacquer and were greater than a quarter of an inch. The nurse stated that her nails were polished with a gel polish that had been UV light cured. Organizational policy states nurses in the perioperative setting should maintain healthy, short, natural nails, artificial fingernails, or extenders. Nail liqueur or enhanced nail liqueur are prohibited, and nail lengths should not exceed two millimeters. That's because they based it on an AORN guideline. These are the AORN guidelines. If your organization chooses to adopt those and chooses to have that policy, that is what the Joint Commission will survey you to. But we do not require that you choose the AORN guideline. AORN often provides you with additional information for and background for their guidelines. We ask that you look and read those guidelines. What does the Joint Commission require? We require compliance with 1A, 1B, 1C recommendation, which if you look at those related to artificial fingernails, it says, the CDC says, do not wear artificial fingernails or extenders when having direct contact with patients at high risk. And then they say, i.e., and e.g., in the operating rooms. And who says don't do it when having direct contact with patients? So we would expect an organization to have a policy or process or practice that complies with at least the CDC or WHO requirements. So what will the surveyor score you on? Based on this, we would score based on the organization's choices and policies. The minimum requirement is that organizations do not allow care providers having direct contact with patients at high risk to wear artificial fingernails. The interesting thing here is CDC and WHO do not define artificial fingernails, and they do not define patients at high risk. We expect the organization to define in their policies, processes, and procedures what they consider an artificial fingernail, what they consider patients at high risk, and we will score you accordingly. So in summary, I'm going to start us off with this question. Is this organization compliant with Joint Commission standards? And really what it comes down to is, what is your policy on personal protective equipment? What do you require at the field? Do you require fluid-resistant gowns? Do you require eye protection? Do you require hair covering as personal protective equipment? If your policy says that your hair covering is not personal protective equipment, but rather part of your dress code, then the gentleman on the left who has his cloth cap, you would decide is that acceptable or not acceptable as part of your dress code. And the Joint Commission would survey you accordingly. So with that, I would like to remind you about that hierarchy and remind you that you have the link to get there. And I would like to now open it up for questions. Great, thank you so much, Sylvia. Yeah, we have a few questions to get through. Um, the first question is, um, I work in an ambulatory eye center and they don't provide my scrubs. Don't they have to provide and wash my scrubs? Ah, that's a great question. So the first thing we need to do is look at it from the hierarchical approach. The first thing is there a regulation. Is there a regulation in your state that says that your employer must provide you with a uniform? Or is there a requirement in your state that surgical services, that scrubs used in surgical services must be laundered or provided by your employer? Because there are some states that do require that and then it would be required. However, if it is part of your dress code, then it would not fall under the OSHA regulations. OSHA regulations only apply to personal protective equipment. And if your employer has decided that your scrubs are not part of personal protective equipment and there is no applicable law, then your employer may ask you to provide your own scrubs and launder your scrubs. There's, that's the answer. Okay, <laughs> great, thanks, Sylvia. Um, another question that's coming is, why do we get cited for not cleaning the top of the vial with alcohol if, oh. if I just pop the metal lid off? 
asked an excellent question. I wish I had included a picture. Um, and so wiping the vial off the top is part of standard precautions that are required by the Joint Commission. And so you can find the exact examples of standard precautions in one of two documents. One is called Core Practices for All Healthcare Facilities. And you can go to the CDC website and just put in CDC Core Practices and that will come up. And wiping the vial with an alcohol wipe is an example that is given. The other place you can find that is to, to look at CDC isolation, and that's you would not think that that's where it is, but isolation guidelines, they cover standard precautions and wiping the vial is part of standard precautions. Now, the, everybody says, okay, so you just told me where it came from, but why? It's got a cover on it. Actually, it doesn't have a cover on it. Think about that vial that you put your fingernail under and you flip that top off. It's not sealed. So anything could have gotten under the lid and then you can drag it into the vial with your needle and syringe. Why do we do compounding of certain medications under a hood? to add that safety measure because that needle could drag something dirty into what you are going to administer. So very important that alcohol is going to do the quick kill and kill organisms that are easily killed by alcohol. But the other thing is it's going to wipe any dirt, dust, debris out of the way and possibly any bacteria that may have gotten under there. So that's why we want you to wipe. That's great. Another question here is, can we set up the crash C-section room in advance? Can you set up the crash C-section room in advance? So the Joint Commission does not have a prescriptive answer to that. What it comes down to is, what is your organization's process and what have they evaluated as the requirements, right? So at this point, you need to think about any requirements, um, for example, right, IV fluids. IV fluids, if you look at the instructions for use, um, some products come in a pre-wrapped bag. And once the bag is opened, it says it's only good for X amount of time. So if you pre-set up your field, you need to take into account all of those instructions for use. The other thing you need to take into account is the sterility of the field. AORN has provided guidance on how you can maintain the, the sterility of the sterile field in an operating room. If your organization has chosen to follow that guidance and followed that process and can explain their process, then the answer is yes, you could set up a C-section room in advance. Um, again, that's going to, what we're going to survey you to is what is the process that you followed to develop what you're doing and how are you monitoring that it is effective and it is not providing risk to your patients. Now, the difference there is, because I got always got to add that little bit of extra, can you set up a delivery cart, right? So a vaginal delivery is going to happen. You're setting up carts and you're putting them into a closet with a covering over them. That's different than setting up for a C-section. Um, that cart that's going to get moved down the hall, how do you know it's still sterile? What process have you put in place to make sure it's sterile? Um, how do you know it's not been sitting there for three weeks because somebody kept putting in the, the next one? So you really need to be careful about those processes. Um, I suggest that you look at the AORN guidance that they provided. Okay, following on from that, there's a question here is that from an attendee who's says, I'm a little bit confused. In SPT, SPD, sorry, always the ANSI Amy ST79 was our Bible. The AORN is the one to use as reference guidelines or both. <laughs> so that is why I am on the line doing this webinar. So please, there will be an article eventually coming out in OR today um, that talks about consensus documents versus evidence-based guidelines. There has been a lot of misunderstanding um, about the role of consensus documents. And I think CMS helped us in June and July to clarify what the requirements are. AMI is a consensus document. AMI themselves came to me and said, could you please start telling organizations about the forward? Because in the forward, it explains things like shall and should and may and must and how they are applied. Please, AMI, unless it is required by your state, it is your choice 
to choose to use it or not to use it as an evidence-based guideline. That is not to say it is not a good a good consensus document. It is really a compilation of hundreds of years of wonderful best practices. But unless it is required by regulation, we cannot make you follow it. Um, it is again your choice. Um, so please, if this if the surveyor says which evidence-based guideline do you follow, and you say Amy we would expect you to explain your process about what parts of EMI have you incorporated, and also think, talk a little bit about why you incorporated, if there's any questions. I hope that helps. Okay, another question here is, um, you said that organizations must follow IFUs when they reprocess instruments. Is that only for HLD and sterilization? We don't use the term reprocess for cleaning and disinfecting non-critical equipment. Please, please, please clarify this. <laughs> so that's important. So every manufacturer for any FDA approved medical device must provide labeling instructions. That's called labeling. Reprocessing or cleaning is part of labeling. So those manufacturers have to provide you with validated instructions for cleaning disinfection or sterilization of medical devices. The expectation is that organizations follow those instructions. Why is that? Because even though the pop-up wipe A that you are using kills MRSA and E. coli and all these organisms, and pop-up B cleans MRSA and E. coli and all of these things, so they kill the same thing, they may have a functional impact on your instrument. The one I like to use there, and again, I use these only as examples, not to endorse or disparage any product, but if you look at a GE um, ultrasound probe and you look at a Philips ultrasound probe, they may say, one says you can use an alcohol product and the other one says you can't. Why would alcohol make a difference? Because alcohol can have an effect on the plastic, it can yellow the plastic, it can dry the plastic, it can lead to cracking of the plastic, which then makes it not able to be disinfected. So please, when you are looking at product choices and IFUs, you need to know not just that it's going to kill the bacteria or it's going to clean the surface, but what effect is it going to have on the functionality of that piece of equipment? Um, again, I hope that helps. Okay, we've got time to squeeze one more in. Um, lots of items are being reprocessed now because of supply and chain issues which is after the 2015 IFU guidance. How, how are we able to reprocess N95 masks? So the N95 respirators uh, were part of an EUA, an emergency um, authorization from the FDA, that they um, came out with um, information that allowed certain N95s to be reprocessed, and they also approved methods to use to reprocess those N95s. They also approved extended use during COVID. Um, you know, it, at, at some point it was, we there aren't enough. And this is believed to be the best type of mask in certain situations. And so how can we optimize those use while we get enough worldwide? Um, and so when we are allowed to do something like that, the FDA, is the one who is authorized to make those exceptions. So what I tell organizations when they are struggling with an IFU is the first place you go to is the manufacturer. And many manufacturers, even though this guidance is out there, have not followed it because the FDA did not make it a requirement that they go back and relook at their labeling and their instructions. But when you have an IFU that you cannot follow, the first place to go is to the manufacturer. And beware, not the distributor, but the manufacturer of that device. The manufacturer of the device then should be able to help you get updated information to do it appropriately. Now, they may not agree that you can use product A instead of product B. They may tell you, sorry, we can't tell you it's safe, in which case you can't do it. However, you can also go to the FDA, the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. So you work with a manufacturer. You try to get clarification on the IFU and you are unsuccessful. Now you're left with this piece of equipment that you can't reprocess. You 
don't have instructions to do it. You've tried and you've tried to resolve it. The next place to do is go to what's called DICE, D-I-C-E, and that's part of the FDA, and you can put it in your web browser and do FDA, D-I-C-E, and you will get a phone number and an email to contact the FDA to say, I need assistance, can you help? And they will actually respond. Um, it usually takes them anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, but they will respond and try to help you through the process. And that's great, Sylvia. We've come to the end of our hour. So um, I have got quite a few other questions, Sylvia, but I will forward them to you. So attendees, um, be on the lookout for any replies from Sylvia in the next few days. So thank you, Sylvia, for your time today and for a really great and informative presentation. Um, please visit today's sponsor website, ahcquality at jointcommission.org to learn more about the service they provide to our industry. As promised, the answer to today's trivia question is Georgia. So congratulations to our winner, Heather Evers. Just a quick reminder, you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your certificate and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once you've submitted your survey. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com and please visit OR Today Webinars Live for more details of all our upcoming webinars and for complimentary registration. Thank you once again for your time today and enjoy the rest of your day.